Well, good morning and welcome to Covenant Presbyterian Church to all of you who are joining us online and uh, for those of you who have received our all clear this morning that the air quality has improved and uh, we expected a, a fairly light group this morning. We do have a light one, but we're, we're so glad that we could be both here physically this morning on this Lord's Day and also for those of you who could join us virtually and want to say a special welcome to our visitors. Perhaps this is your first introduction to our covenant family and we say this every week. It's not ideal that we have to meet in this sort of way during a time of pandemic and now a time where we're inundated with some smoke from our wildfires. But I was reminded of a a quote that's in our worship guide this morning that uh, was uttered by Eric Little, the uh, famous Scotsman runner uh, that was featured in Chariots of Fire and uh, later gave his life on the mission field in China. He wrote this, Circumstances may appear to wreck our lives and God's plans, but God is not helpless among the ruins. Our broken lives are not lost or useless. God's love is still working. He comes in and takes the calamity and uses it victoriously, working out his wonderful plan of love. And that is a good reminder as we come on a day like today to have our hearts reoriented and recalibrated, uh, knowing that God is sovereign, he is good, he is in control, he will use the uh, apparent chaos of our world right now to carry forward his purposes, his glory. And uh, it is his people, the church, that we believe uh, can present to a weary world right now Uh, the joy of what it means to be in the shelter of his wings, to find a refuge in our great God, which leads us to our call to worship this morning, which is from Psalm 91, verses 1 and 2. And uh, I'm going to invite you, if you're able to stand this morning, uh, please do. Let us hear the word of the Lord calling us into his presence. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Please pray with me. Father, we come this morning reminded that in you we find rest. In a weary world and amongst our weary lives where there seems to be chaos, where the year 2020 continues to surprise us with new challenges, we know nothing surprises you. Nothing catches you off guard. Your eye is always on us. Your eye is on this world. Your eye is on the cosmos. You are ordering all things perfectly, even using the chaos and brokenness of the world and what we experience in our own lives to bring glory, to spread the news, the good news, that in the Lord Jesus Christ, we can have a hope that will not disappoint, that will transcend circumstances and challenges and difficulties. And now with that hope in our hearts, may you uh, refresh us this morning as we set our eyes upon you and not upon the things of this world As we worship you, our great God and King, in Christ's name, amen. Uh, Stay standing and worship our King this morning. My name's Ted. I'm excited to lead you in some singing here. So um, if you're at home and watching, the words should appear right there on the screen. And obviously, if you're here, it's in your worship folder. Oh, worship the King, all glorious above, and gratefully sing His power and His love. Our shield and defender, the Ancient of Days, pavilioned in splendor and girded with praise. O oh, tell of his might, O oh, sing of his grace, who 
whose robe is the light, whose canopy space, whose chariots of wrath the deep thunder clouds form, and dark is his path on the wings of the storm. Thy bountiful care, what tongue can recite? It breathes in the air, it shines in the light. It streams from the hills, it descends to the plain, and sweetly distills in the dew and the rain. Frail children of dust, and feeble as frail in thee do we trust nor find thee to fail thy mercies how tender how firm to the end our maker defender redeemer and friend Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glory. Blessed be your name When the sun's shining down on me When the world's all as it should be Blessed be your name Blessed be your name On the road marked with suffering pain in the offering. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. And you give and take away. You give and take away, my heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Well, you may be seated.
song we just sang uh, reminds us that we should bless the name of the Lord even when our circumstances are difficult. We should give thanks to God in all things, not just when times are favorable to us. But yet we don't always do this. Like Israel in the wilderness, we often grumble and complain about our circumstances rather than trusting that God will actually cause all things to work together for good. So we need to come to our Father and confess our attitude of complaining and confess our lack of trust in him and confess many other things as well. I'm going to read a passage that reminds us of these ideas. It's from Philippians 2, 12 through 16, and then I'll invite us to confess altogether our brokenness. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. I want to invite you all uh, at home and here uh, to confess together. Merciful God, you made us in your image and redeemed us to restore us to your likeness. You have granted us a mind to know you, a heart to love you, and a will to serve you. But we have allowed lesser things to grab hold of our hearts, distracting us from knowing you more, making our love inconstant, and our obedience incomplete. In your tender love, forgive us and renew our affection for you and you alone. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, let's take some time now to just come before the Father uh, silently. Well, thanks be to God that our sins that we have confessed and many others that we don't recall uh, have been forgiven. And uh, our Lord Jesus has taken those sins upon himself. It says in 2 Corinthians 8, 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. Our next song that we're going to sing together uh, reminds us that Jesus did become poor, weak, and helpless, ultimately laying down his own life so that we could have assurance of salvation, eternity with him. Let's stand together and sing, Who is this so we can help us? Who is this so weak and helpless, child of lowly Hebrew maid, rudely in a stable shelter, coldly in a manger lay? Tis the Lord of all creation. This wondrous path has trod. He is Lord from everlasting and to everlasting God. Who is this? A man of sorrows, 
walking sadly life's hard way homeless weary sighing weeping over sin and Satan's sway tis our God our glorious Savior who above the starry sky is for us a place preparing where no tear can dim the eye. Who is this? Behold him shedding drops of blood upon the ground. Who is this? Despised, rejected, mocked, insulted, beaten down. Tis our God who gifts and graces on his church is pouring down. Who shall smile in holy vengeance? All is for. this that hangs there dying while the rude world scoffs and scorns numbered with the malefactors torn with nails and crowned with thorns tis our God who lives forever mid the shine in one's on high in the glorious golden city reigning everlastingly good morning this mic turned around I'm Will Hawk and I'm going to lead us in a time of prayer and uh it's kind of fun to think we're joining in prayer, not just here on site, but in your homes. And uh, for some of you around the world who are watching us from Africa or wherever else in the United States you might be, uh, we join together with one voice in prayer to our God at this time in our worship service that praying corporately is not someone up front offering a prayer, but it's you joining in with the person up front leading uh us in prayer. So I'm going to attempt to do that this morning as we use some of the Psalms and some scripture uh, that I think will resonate with you. So let's come to the Father together in a time of prayer. Abba, Father, who art in heaven, give ear to our prayers for your good, your forgiving, you abound in steadfast love to everyone who calls upon you. Father, we give thanks to you today uh, with our whole heart for your steadfast love. The way you've shown that love by effectually calling us to yourself, giving us a new birth, giving us faith, giving us the powerful spirit that keeps us and uses us for your glory. We are so thankful today to you that uh, in your righteousness we stand faultless before the throne. Thank you for the finished, complete work of Jesus Christ that gives us a righteousness that exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees that causes us to stand today before you faultless, knowing that as you look at us, Lord, you do not shake your head in disappointment, but you smile upon us, you rejoice over us, and you sing over us. We're so thankful that you love us for who we are and who you've called us to be, not based on our performance. Revive us, Lord. Revive us again today, as the psalmist said, so we can rejoice. Open our ears, open our hearts to hear what you speak to us as you speak peace, as you speak uh, confidence and love to your people. 
Father, you're the, you're the God of hope. And uh, as we meet today, as your church, we pray that you will fill us with all joy and peace so that as we trust in you, we can overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Sovereign God, your perfect love for us cast out all fear. That's what you said. And the threats around us right now are many, a lot of reasons to fear and to be living in fear, but we don't have to. The pandemic, the fires, the economy, the politics, give us peace, confidence, and courage as we live in these times. Lord, give us deep joy, knowing that you're greater than our greatest fears, that we can count it all joy when we face trials and afflictions, knowing that the testing of our faith produces steadfastness. Cast out fear. Help us not to be people of fear, but people of faith. Your joy is our strength, Lord. Forgive us for the ways we sabotage, sabotage your joy the joy bombs that we drop in our own life with our unbelief and fear and resentment. Forgive us, Lord, for hitching our joy wagon to COVID vaccines or election outcomes or spouses' affection or our children's successes. That's not the source of our true joy. You are. And fill us today, Lord, with the inexpressible and glorious joy that your Bible talks about that comes from belonging to you, Jesus, and how you love and cherish and rejoice in us. Your joy is the fuel of our Christian life. Your joy is the wind in our sails. We don't have to be rowing and toiling and worrying and trying to get our boats to move. But your joy is the wind in our sails and ultimately the joy that really gives us a clear vision of you. Our God who sneaks joy in the back door of our hearts as we look at you. Thank you, Father, for the blessings of prosperity and the blessings of comfort that most of us are enjoying today. In spite of our complaining attitudes, Lord, we are so blessed in many, many ways to live in this country and to live as we do in prosperity compared to the world at large. We join together today to pray for those who are suffering and for the hundreds of thousands of refugees in Lebanon who were already suffering before that terrible explosion two weeks ago. We pray for Samaritan's Purse and other organizations that are there ministering in your name. We pray for our brothers and sisters in Nigeria and Congo who are being targeted and persecuted for their faith. We pray for the poor and for the homeless in our own community, for the families in our community trying to make it when their husband and father who had been working is now arrested and held in a detention center. We pray for those who are isolated and without social services. We pray for those who are depressed because of this isolation. We pray for the medical and social workers in our nation and in our own country and county and church who are caring for the sick and the isolated. Give us open hearts, give us open hands, give us open wallets to help when you show us need. We pray for our own church family. Lord, we know that there are those in need of healing and recovery. We pray for Sam Hawley You'll continue to work in his life, strengthen him, help him recover for strength and courage and healing for Julie or for safety and care for our elderly who are limited in various ways. For those who have ongoing illnesses and injuries like Pam and Ruth and Jack and many others, we lift up our church family and the physical and spiritual needs uh, of those that we're connected with here at Covenant. Pray for uh, Ryan and Joy 
in Australia, Jenna and Andrew in Africa, Alan and Rosalie in San Luis, Mike and Aaron in Southern California, and Kathy and John in Honduras, for Sue Walston and the children of Uganda, and Jan in Wonderland, and David Choi. These are your servants, those missionaries that we love and support. Lord, give them your peace, your joy, your safety, your hope to shine the light of the gospel in these dark, dark corners of the world. So in all these prayers, Lord, may your will be done and your kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven. So we pray to you, Father, through you, our Savior, and in your comfort, our spirit. Amen. You have um, three different ways to continue giving your offerings to Covenant. They're listed in your worship folder. Uh, you can do it online by going to covenantpaso.com. You can send it via U.S. mail to the address listed uh, there, 1450 Golden Hill Road. Or if you're here in person, there's a little box over there that uh, we'll be happy to take your, your offering in. So let's pray and ask God to uh, uh, give us open hearts. I would like to tell you that God has blessed Covenant during this time. Uh, we have uh, not seen a big reduction in our offerings, and you guys have been faithful to continue to give and support the work and ministry of our missionaries and church here. Thank you for doing that, and let's thank God. Father, we are thankful that you've shown yourself faithful uh, to supply all the needs of our local church body and family and ministry. Thank you for giving uh, our people open hearts, and generous hearts to give to the work of, of the kingdom here in this town. We pray that the gifts we give will be used for your glory and that you'll guide the deacons, especially as they make a budget and as they plan on how to spend this, these uh, monies in ways that will best and most effectively glorify you, not just here on this location, but in our town, in our city, in our country, and, and in the world as we support these missionaries and other works and needs around the world. We pray for the Deacons Fund, that the money given there would help uh, particular people in need. And as we see families in need, Lord, that you will help us uh, notify and, and use some of these resources that are there and available to help people with rent or with groceries or in ways that... Uh, they need during this time in their life for whatever reason. So thanks for this time to give these offerings as an act of worship. We pray you'll receive them and bless them. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Will. We should be on. Okay, there we are. We're going to be looking at a text in 2 Corinthians this morning, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 13. It's on page 8 of your worship guide. We're nearing the end of our series in 2 Corinthians. We uh, have just one more week, so we've managed to navigate through it fairly, uh, fairly unaltered through this uh, interesting time we're in. And I hope it has proven to be a helpful study and series for you. I know it has been for me. Uh, the Focus of Treasure in Jars of Clay, which I titled this series, which speaks to Paul's burden to convince those at the church at Corinth that God, uh, God's grace flows from mountaintops into empty valleys, that God is opposed to the proud but gives grace to the humble, that God delights to minister the gospel through broken jars of clay to display his beauty and his glory. And the reason that Paul has leaned so hard into this dynamic of the gospel, the good news that God takes broken things and redeems them, is that Corinth and a certain segment within the church at Corinth had been allured and attracted to a band of so-called super apostles that have been celebrity apostles, if you will. They're actually false apostles, according to Paul. 
but they are brash and they're bold and they're eloquent and they're stylish and they boast a lot about their credentials and about their experiences and somehow that has taken a hold and is and and Paul has been referred to as weak and unimpressive and so it is not a battle for Paul at Corinth to restore his reputation. It's something much, much more drastic because what's happening is this shift from really believing the gospel, how God works, how Jesus came in weakness. So what's at gr- really at stake is the gospel itself. And we're going to, in the text this morning, delve right back into this argument that Paul is presenting about why we boast in the Lord alone. But he's going to play the fool again and say, okay, you want to play the boasting game? I'll play it for a little bit, but it really is foolish. So let's, uh, let's dive in. 2 Corinthians 12, 1 to 13. Hear the word of the Lord. I must go on boasting, though there's nothing to be gained by it. I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. On behalf of this man, I will boast. But on my own behalf, I will not boast, except of my weaknesses. Though if I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it, so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. So to keep me from becoming conceited, Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I have been a fool. You forced me to it. For I ought to have been commended by you. For I was not at all inferior to these super apostles, even though I am nothing. The signs of a true apostle were performed among you with utmost patience, with signs and wonders and mighty works. For in what were you less favored than the rest of the churches, except that I myself did not burden you? Forgive me this wrong. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. Father, may you take your word that's living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword that is profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, training, and righteousness, that the people of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. May you apply your word deeply to our hearts by the Holy Spirit this morning, whether we're here present physically or joining online may you do what only you can do which is transform our hearts and we ask that you do that through the mighty name of jesus amen one of the stories i remember growing up was about my uncle pick we called him Pick. His name was Arthur. I, I don't know why he got the nickname Pick, but he was Uncle Pick to us. And Uncle Pick was uh, strong, uh, entrepreneurial, started a, a tire shop in 
San Francisco with, with my other uncle, Uncle Steve. Uh, very successful, and uh, but then was stricken with multiple sclerosis that began to very surely uh, debilitate him to the point where he was almost bed bound. He was certainly wheelchair bound. I remember the story that my Aunt Sophie would share about the time they were trying to go somewhere and in the garage while he was being transferred from the wheelchair into the car. And my Aunt Sophie is very, very petite. He fell on the garage floor. Now, Aunt Sophie pleaded with him that she could call for help. They had two really strong boys that lived in the area, and uh, he, but he did not want anyone to come to have to pick him up off the garage floor. So uh, he was um, proud and, of course, you know, had always been a self-doer and thought, well, what if I, uh, he had Aunt Sophie help him tie the garage door pull string to his belt and tried to use the garage door opener to lift him up rather than call for help. This is, I could do this. And so, uh, and if I remember the story correctly, the, the garage door broke and, um, and then he had to, in weakness, call for help. I've broken a lot of garage doors in my life. No, really, literally I have, but, I've, but figuratively, I've, I've broken a lot of garage doors too, trying to think that my own resourcefulness, my own skill set, my own past successes would somehow be able to gain the day, somehow bring me to a place of greater success, somehow uh, further me along in flourishing and the message of the gospel, the message that Paul is trying to reiterate and reaffirm is that God works his power when we are most dependent upon him. He will allow us to break garage doors uh, over and over again until we are willing to realize that we do not have the resources within ourselves to live the life he has called us to live. God delights to fill empty jars of clay with the treasure of the gospel. And part of the process, if you will, of our growth as Christians is to learn how to get stuff out of that jar to make more room for the treasure and stop filling it with our own accomplishments and our own resourcefulness uh, in our own abilities that we want to put on display because we want credit, we want validity, we want status, and that's kind of where we're at with the heart of the Corinthians as well. The true apostle, Paul, has learned that God makes his power work perfect in weakness. And the sooner we learn this ourselves, the sooner we will grow and flourish uh, in our life of faith also. So I want to talk about really two headings from this text. Power made perfect. What does that mean? How does that apply at the Church of Corinth? How does it apply in our life? And then his all-sufficient grace. His all-sufficient grace and how that takes center stage uh, in Paul's life, and how he longs to see it central to the life of the church at Corinth, and how we must continue to long for his all-sufficient grace to be our bedrock, our central hope, our only hope as a church and as individual followers of Jesus Christ. So let's talk about power made perfect. It's interesting that Paul uses the word power as he navigates the Corinthians through this text, because power was what the super apostles were seeking to gain. They wanted the power. They wanted the, uh, the status, the influence. They wanted uh, the ability to manipulate, to call the shots, if you will, to be recognized as incredibly powerful men in the church. That was their chief aim, was to wow and awe through their experiences, 
ecstasies, revelations they've had in the past and through their powerful oratorial, oratory skills that they were seeking to impress others with. That should not be foreign, a foreign thought to us because part of our fallen baggage as people, as humans, as those who have suffered from the fall of the human race is a craving for power a lust for power, if you will. Now, it doesn't always come out overtly, and, but, but there's subtle ways that we long for power, too. We long to be able to, for recognition. We long for approval. We long for status. We long to be able to manipulate the world around us, the cosmos in which we live, and the people around us, too. And we find incredible ways we're incredibly resourceful when it comes to trying to achieve power for ourselves. It's not a foreign thought throughout the scriptures. It's precisely what initiates judgments like at the flood or at the Tower of Babel, this craving for power, this craving to be able to be our own masters, uh, to be able to manipulate the world around us and people around us, and ultimately to manipulate God himself, which seems to be the effort at the Tower of Babel in the book of Genesis. Let us build a tower that reaches into the heavens and make a name for ourselves. The implication is they're trying to get one over on God himself and to be able to call upon the powers of God for their bidding and their doing. You get a taste of it in James and John, the sons of Zebedee, when they think they're doing the right thing by telling Jesus, do you want us to call down fire from heaven upon these cities that have rejected the gospel? Frankly, it's, it's amazing they felt they had the power to do that, but they, they actually did feel they had that power, and they thought they were doing Jesus a, a solid by asking him, hey, we're going to take care of this ourselves. You find it in the tragic story of a young King Uzziah in the Old Testament narratives through the kings, one who had such great success in his early period of, of reigning over the southern kingdom of Judah, had built wonderful things, had restored cities. And then there's that one hinge phrase in the narrative of his life it says he was marvelously helped until he became strong that's how the chronicler describes it he was marvelously helped by god of course until he became strong and when he became strong he felt he had the power he had the rights to go in and actually uh, perform the role of a priest you have it evident in Simon the Magician in the book of Acts, who, seeing the power of the Holy Spirit come upon those who had embraced the Lord Jesus Christ at the hands of Peter, offers to buy this gift, this power, with money, and is told that he's still in his sin as a result. That lust, that craving for power, is evident in all of us still, that fallenness. Now, the tragic end of our power, ultimately, unless we come to that place of absolute dependence and trust in God, is that we reject God, ultimately. That seems to be the trajectory we find in the book of Romans, chapter 1, that mankind, humanity, bent on, on fashioning their own future, exhibiting their own power, getting glory from each other, their foolish hearts were darkened. And they failed to give thanks. They rejected God in their own quest for their own power, establishing themselves. The tragic end is when we rely on ourselves, our own wisdom, our own ability. We break a lot of garage doors. We fracture a lot of relationships. We end up, uh, unless God grabs a hold of us, running further and further away from the one source that could actually help us and accomplish all this, the mighty, sufficient grace of God. Paul says that his power, he's, Paul's boasting here, he's playing the boast game 
with the Corinthians, but he describes, this is really foolish that I have to do this, is in other words. But if you want to know, I've had visions. And so Paul begins to describe almost in this third person about a man in Christ who is Paul, we come to discover, that got caught up to the third heaven. The best we can make of that and the understanding of heaven at that time in, in the early period of the church um, carried over from Judaism was that that was the immediate presence of God. Paul describes this incredible encounter, this revelation, this so amazing that he was, it, it was unutterable, inexpressible, not that it was unintelligible what he saw and heard in the third heaven, but it was, it was beyond the, the ability even to express it. Now normally, in our day and age, someone has a vision or experience like that, we expect a best-selling book, we expect a movie to follow, we expect an incredibly popular speaking circuit to take place, and we expect everybody else wanting to get in on whatever that person experienced. So we have to ask the question, why is Paul, this, this vision of his, this incredible revelation happened 14 years ago. Uh, the best we understand it was when he was in Tarsus. He was kind of sidelined after his time in Damascus, after his conversion. And uh, he's, uh, this is before his first missionary journey. It's before Barnabas grabs him and says, you're coming with me and we're going to go spread the gospel to the Gentiles. And Paul's kind of a little bit, this is so we don't know the precise timing of it all we know is that paul has never anywhere in any of his instruction to the churches referenced this incredible vision the only vision he speaks about often is his conversion experience with the lord jesus it's that because that was central to his gospel message that god subdues rebels and makes them into his choice sons and servants so that that encounter with Jesus, he was glad to share and boast in <clears throat> because it boasted in his stupidity as a fire-breathing Pharisee fighting against the very God he thought he was serving. But this vision, this incredible, beautific vision he had in the third heaven, he hasn't told anyone about this that we know of. It doesn't show up anywhere. He's not using this as a badge or a credential but he's forced to kind of go there to say, okay, these super apostles are talking about, ooh, we had this vision, and oh, I had this dream, and, you know, listen to us, because God has spoken directly to us. And Paul's saying that th when you lead with that, there's something afoot. When you try to gain a, an audience based on some ecstatic experience that you had, and... Uh, try to gain authority in the life of a church, that does not seem to be the way the gospel works or that Paul operates. And that's true to this day, we would say also. That God has chosen to reveal himself first and foremost and ultimately in his son, Jesus Christ. And that revelation of Christ, uh, God through Christ has been given to us and handed to us in the Holy Scriptures from the foundation of the apostles the prophets and teachers and now we carry into our hands this living word of god that is the primary sole source of the authorized revelation of god does this mean that god doesn't communicate to us in other ways well no certainly he does but all those things are made subsidiary to what god has revealed to us in his scriptures his power is made perfect. So Paul doesn't tout this story. In fact, he brings it up more to talk about a thorn in his flesh. Paul says that even I cannot bear the ring of power and not let it corrupt me, if you will, if I could quote Tolkien. That even Paul, having such an incredible grand vision of God, God had to put a thorn in his flesh a messenger of Satan. We don't know exactly what this was, but we're pretty sure it was some physical ailment. We get a little bit of a clue, and although it's not conclusive, many 
Scholars, commentators have felt that Paul had some sort of vision or eye uh, ailment because uh, in Galatians, uh, he says, you were, you were willing to pluck out your eyes and give them to me. And we're thinking that maybe Paul had some, um, some vision issue, some eye problem that was unsightly and difficult and troublesome. But God says, Jesus says to him, my grace is sufficient for you because my power is made perfect in weakness. It's very interesting. The, the made perfect here is the Greek word telos. It, it means design. My power is designed uh, to lead to a perfect end through your weakness. That God has, uh, he doesn't send thorns or difficulties that remind us of our weakness, that put us on the floor of the garage where we cry out to him. He does that with a specific design, a perfect end in mind. That end in mind is our complete trust and rest in him, by which then his power flows, enabling us to endure all that the world has and all the messengers of Satan buffet us with, that we have the power to endure it because it's his power. It's designed to teach us to look to him and only to him and to his all-sufficient grace. And here's our second heading. Paul leads into this, the words of Jesus. Jesus said to me, but he said to me, verse 9, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. I want to read to you what Charles Spurgeon Back in 1876 at the Metropolitan Tabernacle Church in London, as he preached on this verse, said this, and I I find it so moving and beautiful. I wanted to share it with you. This is what Spurgeon said to his church in 1876. This sufficiency, my sufficiency is My grace is sufficient for you. This sufficiency is declared without any limiting words. And therefore, I understand the passage to mean that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ is sufficient to uphold you, sufficient to strengthen you, sufficient to comfort you, sufficient to make your trouble useful, Sufficient to enable you to triumph over it. Sufficient to bring you out of it. Sufficient to bring you out of 10,000 like it. Sufficient to bring you home to heaven. Whatever would be good for you, Christ's grace is sufficient to bestow. Whatever would harm you, his grace is sufficient to avert. Whatever you desire, his grace is sufficient to give you if it be good for you. Whatever you would avoid, his grace can shield you from it. So if so, his wisdom shall dictate. Here let me press upon you the pleasing duty of taking home the promise personally at this moment. For no believer here need be under any fear, since for him also at this very instant the grace of the Lord Jesus is sufficient. Charles Spurgeon was leaning into the fact that when Paul said 14 years ago, Jesus said to me, my grace is sufficient. He uses a tense that is meaning that it's present and future as well. This wasn't some past, oh, 14 years ago. He's saying that over and over again, Jesus is repeatedly saying to him, my grace is sufficient for you. Yesterday, today, and forever. And I want you to take that to heart this morning because we've had a very unusual, crazy, contentious, calamitous year, haven't we? The world has had a crazy, calamitous, contentious year. I know that every year has its, has its challenges. This one seems to be particularly uh, pressing in upon us. Jesus' words speak to us in this moment right now. To you, and I invite you to put your name in that. Jesus said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient for you. Whatever 
you feel overwhelmed by right now, whatever you feel pressing in upon you right now, whatever you feel is insurmountable to you right now. And that could be a long history of struggle in your own life, of overcoming besetting sins or relational struggles and baggage. It could be something external to you, financial pressures, physical health pressures. And you are saying, I cannot get through this. You are right where you need to be to call upon the Lord and for to hear his voice say, my grace is sufficient for you. So much so that Paul learned to be content now in these weaknesses, these calamities. I'm content with insults, hardships, for when I am weak, I am strong. And this would be Paul's word to the Philippian church, too, of learning to be content in whatever circumstances he is in. He learned it. Did you hear that? You and I have to learn it as well. We have to learn every time we, our plans fail and we run out of our resources, the sooner we realize that we don't have the resources to do these things, to overcome these things, to endure through these things, the sooner we can hear that voice say again to us, my grace is sufficient for you. And why is that so? Well, it's so because Jesus brings to us the ultimate power made perfect through the ultimate weakness in his own life. And that again is Paul's argument to the Corinthian church. As the pattern of Paul's life is the pattern, is a mere shadow of the pattern of the life of Jesus. Very interesting that Paul prays three times for this thorn to be removed. I think anyone who familiar with the gospel narratives would see the connection. Jesus three times in the garden of Gethsemane asked that God might remove this cup from me. And the answer was no, but Jesus was given the strength. Angels ministered to him to endure what lay ahead of him on the cross. Paul had a thorn in his flesh. Jesus took the ultimate thorn upon himself, not just the crown of thorns that he wore that was pressed into his forehead, but the thorn, the death nail of the wrath of God poured out on him instead of us. And that would seem to be the weakest display of the power of God, the Son of God dying on the cross was the ultimate display of the power and wisdom of God that defies all the wisdom and power plays of our world. And that's why the gospel alone has the power of salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. May his all-sufficient grace meet you this morning, whether you're here or online. May you hear his words to you, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weakness. The sooner we accept that and rest in it and learn it, the sooner we can delight in whatever God sends our way, knowing that he's looking to, again, display his beautiful power through jars of clay like us. Let me pray for us, and we'll prepare to come to the Lord's table. Father in heaven, we praise you this day that you have chosen the weak things of the world to shame the wise and powerful, as 1 Corinthians tells us. That you have taken the things that are not to shame the things that are. That you have intervened and called to yourself men and women and children from every tribe, tongue, and nation who maybe wouldn't be the who's who in their community or in their countries or world, but you have made them the who's who in your family. You have made them your precious children like us. And Lord, may we relish and delight in your extraordinary, undeserved, all-sufficient grace that has come to us this day. And may we celebrate it at the Lord's table, your table, this morning. Give grace to all who hear. Give grace to those who are just beginning to explore who you are. May you lead them into your embrace. Give grace to those who've walked with you for many, many years and find themselves struggling now. Give grace to each of us, for without it we perish. 
In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. As we uh, prepare uh, to observe the Lord's table, we're going to begin by confessing our faith. You'll find this on page 10 of the worship folder, and uh, it won't appear on your screens on YouTube. For that, I apologize. We weren't able to load those frames in for you, but if you were able to download our worship guide, feel free, or if you have it committed to memory, feel free to join us. Christians, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Therefore we proclaim the mystery of the faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Communion is the family meal of Christians, and as such, we invite all baptized believers in the Lord Jesus Christ to join us at this table, to, to taste and see that his grace is sufficient for you. We believe that this is a means of grace. In other words, we, we believe that God gives us the audible gospel and also the visible gospel. He uh, is so kind to us that he wants to engage our senses. And so surely as we eat this bread and drink this cup, so surely as his one sacrificial death on the cross atoned for all your sins, past, present, and future, and credited to you his glorious, perfect, righteous record that has made you his delightful child for all eternity. That is huge, and it's hard for us to take that in. And so we celebrate it at a meal, too, to believe that the very spiritual presence of Christ comes, ushers us into his presence, to again reaffirm those words, my grace is sufficient for you. On the night he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, and after he had given thanks, he broke it, saying, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. This is the visible gospel. This is the divine embrace. This is his word to us today. My grace is sufficient for you. Lord Jesus, meet us in our place of need. We come as jars of clay, empty, weak, fragile, feeble, frail. We come to you who alone can make your power perfect in our weakness. We come for you to fill us with the joy of your presence the power of your indestructible life, your kindness and mercy to flow to us in a way that refreshes us, renews us, and gives us hope and strength to press on through whatever you ordain for us in the days, months, and years ahead, knowing that the perfect end is in mind, your glory, our conformity to the Lord Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. I'm going to invite you in a moment as we're ready at the table to come forward if you are communing today. There are two types of trays on the table. They're clearly marked. One will say wine with gluten-free bread. One will say grape juice with gluten-free bread. The bread is contained in the cup itself, so just take one. Go ahead and return to your seats, and we have a table set over with Pastor Will, and then I'll be right here at this table. Wait till everyone's been served, and then we'll all partake together. 
Come, for all things are now ready. This is the body of Christ, which is for you. Let us take and eat. And this is the blood of Christ shed for the remission of sins for many. Let us take and drink. Please join me in the prayer that you find on the bottom of page 11 as we conclude our time at the table. Loving God, we thank you that you have fed us in this sacrament, united us with Christ, and given us a foretaste of the heavenly banquet in your eternal kingdom. Send us out in the power of your spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. For the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Well, let's stand together, everybody, and sing one final song. Our song, The Lord is My Salvation, has these words in verse 4 I wanted to call your attention to. It says, in times of waiting and times of need, when I know loss and when I'm weak, I know his grace will renew these days. The Lord is my salvation. Let's sing together. <laughs> The grace of God has reached for me And pulled me from the raging sea And I am safe on the solid ground The Lord is my salvation I will not fear when darkness falls his strength will help me scale these walls I'll see the dawn of the rising sun The Lord is my salvation Who is like the Lord our God Strong to save faithful in love My debt is paid and the victory won the lord is my salvation my 
My hope is hidden in the Lord. He flowers each promise of his word. When winter fades, I know spring will come. The Lord is my salvation. In times of waiting, times of need. When I know loss and when I'm weak, I know his grace will renew these days. The Lord is my salvation. Who is like the Lord our God, strong to save, faithful in love? My debt is paid and the victory won. The Lord is my salvation. And when I reach the final day, He will not leave me in the grave. But I will rise, He will call me home. The Lord is my salvation. Who is like the Lord our God, strong to save, faithful? In love, my debt is paid, and the victory won. The Lord is my salvation. Glory be to God the Father. Glory be to God the Son. Glory be to God the Spirit. The Lord is our salvation, and glory be to God the Father, glory be to God the Son, glory be to God the Spirit, the Lord is our salvation. Lord is our salvation. The Lord is our salvation. Now receive this benediction. May our Lord Jesus Christ Himself and God our Father, who loved us and by His grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. Amen. Now let us go forth to serve the world as those who love our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. You are dismissed in peace. <laughs>